Okay. Lecture 10. Let's get started. So we are about one-fourth of the way done with this class. So some of you are thinking, cool. Some of you are thinking, oh, God, I've got to sit through another 30 lectures with this guy. I know, I know. But, okay, um, my apologies on the last recording. I don't know what happened because uh, I, I, um, I'm using OBS to record um, uh, my lectures, and then I hit the stop record button uh, last time, and it, it wouldn't stop. And I got this feeling like something's going to be wrong with the recording. And then when it, I looked at the video, it was only half of it. So I, I, I don't know what happened. But I went ahead and uploaded it just so that we had it. Um, but hopefully that doesn't happen again. Um, I, I know we're a little behind on homework. Um, I think my TA is going to try and get caught up with that this week. Um, but 2.6 was due today. How did the first design assignment go? Okay. I've got another one for you that's um, somewhat um, slightly different uh, for you today, but I've got an additional design example today, and I, I'm, uh, I just want to go through it because it has a somewhat interesting result with it. Um, this is a new example. I, I just formulated that for this semester, so this is my first time doing it, so let's see how it goes. All right, so, okay. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, um, what we're doing now is tension member design. And what tension member design is focused on is selecting an element to safely resist load. So what we've done is we've sort of formulated these two design parameters, which we'll call AG design and then R design. And, and so these are sort of minimum standards, if you would. So we calculate AG design, and then we have to select a member that has at least that much uh, gross area. Then we select, or we compute an R design, and then select a member that has at least that much radius of gyration. Now, one of the things I'm going to do with today's example is I'm going to say select a member to withstand a load, but I'm not going to tell you how long it is. And so since I don't provide the member length, you really can't account for slenderness. So for the purposes of the example, we'll just ignore it. Um, and so I just wanted to mention that, that if I don't give you a member length, you can, you can disregard that. And I might do that on, say, an exam problem just for the, uh, um, the issue of time. Remember, I don't like giving exam problems that take a significant amount of time to do. I try and use that rule of three. Um, okay, so we compute our design parameters and based on the constraints and these parameters, we select the lightest shape that we can based on these, uh, uh, these quantities. And then we analyze the, the trial shape in order to verify its performance. And that's really sort of our focus for today. Uh, and then we summarize the results and compute the efficiency. Um, we have two limit states. I don't think that this example is going to take the full 50 minutes, so I think I'm going to start talking about block shear rupture today um, to kind of show you what it looks like, because it's a little different, um, and uh, uh, it's not hard. If you understand everything we've done so far, I think you can understand block shear pretty easily, but it's a little different. It's a little unique, and so if we have time, we'll, we'll discuss that. But for now, we're only looking at gross section yielding and net section fracture, and these are the two limit states that we're going to consider. And speaking of, this is going to be our star of the show for today, so let me... Um, let me go to my notebook here and pull this up. So we're going to select uh, an MC section. So this is a miscellaneous channel um, to resist a factored load of 212 kips. So first off, one of the things I'm doing is I'm going ahead and giving you the factored load. So we do not take this and do a 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live. Um, we just factor it. Um, uh, it's already factored. Okay. And to be clear, there are some examples throughout the semester where I'm going to go ahead and give you a factored load, just because at some point, like, I know you all can take a dead load and a live load and take 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live, and so at some point we can just sort of move on from that. Um, we are going to assume A36 steel, and I went ahead and gave you the, um, the yield stress and the tensile stress for this, because I kind of wanted to just jump right in to this problem. And the other thing is we do know that the bolt diameter is three quarter of an inch so that tells us that the hole diameter is 
seven eighths of an inch. So, so we know that. Okay. So with that, I think we can go into the process of, of getting into design right now. Um, we have a five step process and step one is the factored load, but we already know step one, that PU is 212 kips. So we've already been given that. So we don't really even need to do anything with step one. But step two, we do need to go ahead and calculate an AG min or an AG design. Okay. So step two, let's go ahead and do that. So AG design equals on the bottom we have the minimum of this and this remember don't forget the squared and PU okay so we'll go ahead and chug this out and we get the minimum of this and we were given FY and FU and this stuff we've already done so and then uh, this is 212 kips now um, what I can tell you is and again, we, we, this denominator, we, I mean, we've actually already done grade 36 steel or A36 steel in this class. So we know that this one will come out to 32.4 KSI. We did this last time. And this one will come out to 32.625 KSI. So, I mean, no, we've already done that. So we can just take 212 divided by this smaller one and we get what? Now I'm going to call on you. 6.54, and we'll take it one more, we'll say 6.543. Not that we need any more than that. Okay. Okay, now um, we don't have an R min, we don't have one, so all we have is a, um, all we have is a, 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 a gross area to select from. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna open up the MC shape, so we're selecting an MC shape, so um, we're going to select the trial shape. And so MCs are in table 1-6. Okay. So I have a tab for the channels. And if you literally turn the page, there's the MC shapes. Now the MC shapes... Go, um, they go on the back page uh, as well. And I'll tell you that um, you might have to do a little bit of hunting on the MC shapes because like with W10s, as you saw in the last homework, like they're very nicely listed in order. But they don't quite follow that with channels sometimes, so you have to do some hunting. So let's see if we can find the lightest um, MC shape available based on a gross area of 6.543. So what shape should we try? 7 by 22.7. Okay. Does everybody see that? And this is on the next page, so it's on 1-42. Okay. Yes, sir. Now you are selecting that based on a gross area of 6.67. But if we're going to analyze this, we're going to need more quantities than just the gross area. So does anybody know what two quantities we're going to need in order to do this? The thickness of the web. The thickness of the web. We're definitely going to need that. What is the web thickness for an MC7 uh, by 22.7? 0 0.503. Anybody know what else we're going to need? No. This will help us with net area, but we need something else. X bar. X bar. We need X bar for the shear lag factor. So X bar 
for a um, MC is what? 1.04. Okay, so these are the properties that we're going to need in order to be able to analyze the tension member. Okay, everybody with me so far? Now, since I've got the schematic up here, I'm going to need to compute the net area and I'm going to need to compute the um, shear lag factor. So let's take the shear lag factor first. What is the connection length going to be for this? Six. Six inches, right? From outside of bolt to outside of bolt. So from there to there. Okay. And the other thing I'll ask is when we calculate net area, we're going to take the gross area minus how many bolt holes? Two. Two. Okay. So that is, that's what we need in order to be able to uh, uh, suss all this out. So let's go ahead and do this. So let's verify the capacity. Okay. So um, the first thing that we can do right off the bat is we can compute gross section yielding. So let's go ahead and do that. And again, this part should be pretty, com you should be pretty comfortable with this at this point because we've done this quite a few times. So how do we compute gross section yielding capacity? What's the formula? 0 0.9 FY times what? AG. So this is 0 0.9 times 36 KSI times the gross area. Now, remember when we're doing this, we're actually analyzing the trial shape. So we're going to use... The 6.67. And so what do we get for this? We'll say 0.1. And do I have a second on that? Let's make sure. Okay. So, all right, let's just take a step back. Tell me what this means. Like, before we move on, what does this mean? Like when I see what like what reaction do you have when you see the number two hundred and sixteen point one? Is it greater than two twelve? There you go. It's greater than two twelve, right? Because remember, our factored load is two hundred and twelve kips. Okay, that's what we're designing for. Okay, so I'll ask again: um, if this is my load and this is my gross section yielding value, what does that mean? It's at, it, we're good, right? This is good. This is a, this is safe. So this is okay, okay? Because we know that we meet, we have enough capacity there. Okay. So now let's look at the net section fracture. Now we can't calculate net section fracture directly right now because we need some quantities. We need the net area and we need the shear lag factor. So the net area is going to be the gross area minus 2 times the uh, hole diameter, the effective hole diameter, times the web thickness, um, which is going to be 6.67 minus 2 times um, 7 eighths times 0 0.503. And what do we get for this? Five point seven nine. Do I have a second on that? Yes. Okay. All right. Now, what about the shear lag factor? What shear lag factor case are we going to use? This is a channel. Remember. Let's see everybody finding their shear lag factor table. Is it first off? Is it case one or case two? Two. two. All right. So we know we're going to be using case two. Now the other question is, do any of the other cases apply, cases three through eight? No, because we're either looking at channels, wide flanges, welded sections, we're, tubes, you know, we're, we're not looking at any of that. So we're just looking at U2, which is one minus that. So one minus 1.04 over six, which is, Do I have a second on that? Okay. So now we can look at net section fracture. Let me get a little bit more room here so I can write. I can do better than that. 
So net section fracture is going to be 0 0.75 Fu An times U, okay? So we take 0 0.75 times our 58 KSI times our net area, but we reduce our net area only to what's effective because of shear lag. And what do we get for this? 208.04. Okay. So I want somebody, first off, second on that? Okay. So I want somebody to make a comment on that. No point. Not good. Exactly right. This is no good. Okay. So, I, I, okay. Let's elaborate on that, though. What does that mean? Like, what, when you say no good, what are you talking about? It doesn't mean efficiency. Well, it does mean efficiency, but, but I mean... It can't withstand the load. It, it, but what can't withstand the load? Mm. Uh, uh, the the this, the MC7 by 22.7. That's, that's what we're talking about. At the very beginning, I said we're going to try an MC7 by 22.7. So we tried it. We analyzed it and we found it doesn't work, okay? So this is why step four is so important, okay? Because remember, like, how did we get to the MC7 by 22.7? Like, let, let's think that through. How did we arrive at picking an MC7 by 22.7? Well, we picked it based off of this, right? We said, here's our gross area for design. We calculated this and we found the smallest shape that had an area bigger than that. But remember, baked into this is one heck of an assumption, right? We assume that the effective net area is 75% of the gross area. Like, that's just a guess, you know? We don't know if that's right or not. That's why we do step four, to verify which section works, or verify that the chosen uh, trial shape that we picked works. And I propose that this section doesn't work. So my question to you is, what do we do? Pick a new section. Okay, so let's go to that. Okay. So we'll call this step four again. Try what? So, so now what shape should we select? Okay, which one do you want to try? Okay, so we're going to pick the next biggest one. Let's try an MC8 by 22.8. Okay, so it has a gross area of? 5.87? You're looking at the 20. No, it's okay. It's okay. This this manual is the first one that has that alternate shading of the rows. So the last manual is even harder. Was, I, I used to tell have just like a little bookmark or a note card or a postcard just just for that. So yeah, that's nothing wrong with that. Okay, six point seven zero. All right. What about the web thickness? And now X bar is. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to do that all over again, okay? Um, and unfortunately, this is sort of the nature of design is that sometimes there's a bit of repetition. Um, and and I'll, I'll talk about that here in a second. So, so what we'll do, so I'm going to go through this part pretty quickly because we've already done this. But so we're going to start off with gross section yielding just like we did last time. which is 0 0.9 FYAG, which is 0 0.9 times 36 KSI times 6.70. So we're using a new area now. And when we chug this out, we get 217.1 kips. So what does that mean? That's good. Because our star of the show for this example is 212. That's the load we have to withstand. 
So gross section yielding, we're good there. Okay, what about net area? Okay, so net area, we compute it the same way. Gross area minus two, that times that. Okay, so 6.70 minus two times seven eighths times now 0 0.427. So interesting, we have a thinner web, and so what that means is we're removing less material from the gross section to get to the net section. So we get 5.953. I don't know if anybody's catching up with me on that C. Did you get the same thing? Okay, good. So U, oh. so now U equals U2, one minus X bar over L. Here, I, I shorthanded that. Let's, let's do it for real. So, so this is 0 0.832, and then we have net section fracture as follows. And so when we chug this one out, we get 215.4. Anybody seconding me on that? Okay. So now what do we get? Is this good or bad? This is good. So now we can say use an MC 8 by 22.8. And what I'll go ahead and say is that its efficiency, when you calculate it, is 98.4%. And so how did I compute that? That's just 212 divided by the smaller of those two. So my apologies for doing yet another channel example because I know we did one last time, but I kind of wanted to do one where it failed during the first iteration. And yes, I mean, structural engineering, like one, and really just any engineering uh, design problem in general does require a bit of iteration. It's sort of the nature of the beast. Um, we can um, uh, control that iteration with common sense design assumptions. So that 0.75, gross area assumption for tension members is actually a really powerful one. It works very well. And there are other assumptions we are going to have to make in this class and in structural engineering in general in order to be able to design. I'll give you an example of one. When we're doing beam design, um, what load must all beams be able to withstand? How about their own self-weight? They have to be able to hold themselves up. But how do you know what a beam self-weight is if you haven't picked it? You see what I mean? You have to assume something, you know what I mean? And there are some common sense assumptions that you can make to try and reduce the amount of iterations. So uh, I just throw that out there just for, um, uh, uh, for the uh, sake of discussion. Okay, um, any questions on this? Okay, we've got a lot of time and I wanna use this time to talk about block shear, okay? Um, I've been mentioning block shear for a while now and I haven't like, actually discussed it in real detail. And so I kind of want to talk about what block shear is um, because it, so the math is going to get a little funky, okay? Um, the equation's going to look a little scary, but I'm going to relate it in some way to something that you all have seen in soils, okay? How many of you are in soils now? How many of you have already taken it? Okay, so for the ones that have already taken it, I'll, I'll, if I mention the term more Coulomb failure criteria, does that ring a bell? The more circle with the line, the envelope, y'all remember, remember that? If, if not, you'll see it, you'll see it. Okay, all right. 
So let's talk about block shear. What is block shear? That's block shear. Okay. So block shear is sort of this um, weird phenomenon, I guess you could say, when you're taking an element and you're applying it in tension, and instead of the tension member failing by yielding or the tension member failing by fracturing along the net section, what happens is this sort of like chunk rips out of the member. Okay. It was actually kind of found by mistake. Like they were doing some tests on some members in a lab in Canada. And they're like, oh, that wasn't supposed to happen. Well, it did. <laughs> um, so let's start looking at it. So this is what block shear looks like. And the reason that we call it block shear is because it is a combination of a failure in tension and in shear where this chunk or this block rips out of the member. Okay. So I've got an example of what it looks like in the lab. Um, so uh, by the way, if you, um, if you notice, does anybody notice something about the lab specimen? Like about, see how it's white? Does everybody see that? So what they do in, in lab specimens is they take the, the specimen and they usually uh, cover it with like a coating of like lye powder and whatnot. Because what happens is as steel yields, the surface will sort of flake off, okay? And so if you look here in this element, you can see how the, the steel's kind of like darker here. That's where you've seen yielding, okay? So that's why they do that. If you ever wondered why, why, why they do that, that's why. Um, over here, this is some analytical work in finite element land. This is like using abacus or something like that. And by the way, finite element land or abacus land, these are just like mass tan analyses on steroids. That's basically what this is. It's the same method that we used last semester. It's just doing way more intricate stuff. So uh, you can do a lot of really cool stuff with finite elements. I could talk about finite elements all day. Um, we teach a graduate level course in finite elements. If you get the chance to take it, take it. It's really good stuff. Okay. So, um, so let's, but let's sort of digest this a little bit. Okay. Block shear is when you have a combination of both a shear failure and a tensile failure. And so what happens is that entire chunk sort of rips out of the section, okay? So if I'm looking at this connection, for example, this connection, what I have is I'm defining, for example, this block, okay? And so if I'm yanking on it like this, I'm proposing that this section of the block is experiencing tension, right? Because I'm taking it and I'm yanking on it, so this plane is being yanked on. But these planes over here on the side are sort of seeing a shear force because here's the block and here's the member and it's sort of doing like that. So it's, they're sliding along one another. So you get a shear force, okay? Um, and the presence of shear in steel design, whenever you see shear, I want you to think of a certain number and that number is 0 0.6. And you're gonna know why do you think you're talking about 0 0.6 with shear? You'll understand why here in a bit, okay? Now in this example, I've got a block that contains two shear paths and one tensile path, okay? It is possible that multiple paths can occur. For example, there is a, another block shear path that could occur that would just look like this, where you would rip this entire chunk out like that. Like that is a potential block shear path. And I propose that that one's actually more realistic, okay? This one would only include one shear path. It would include one tensile path, but the tensile path is bigger. But I propose that the net capacity of my little red shaded block, as opposed to the one on here, that the red one's actually weaker. And so if we're talking about what would govern the capacity, it would be the red one, okay? But you'll, you'll see what I mean uh, here in a bit, okay? Now, let's just rip the Band-Aid off and look at the equation in the spec. So if you open up the specification, and this is in chapter J, so we've been spending this whole time in chapter D. This is in chapter J. So chapter D is the chapter on tension members. Chapter J is the chapter on connections, okay? And so after our first celebration, we're going to be living in connection land for a little while because we're going to be looking at bolts and welds, okay? So if we look at 16.1-146, um, so that's why it's in a... Um, in a uh, uh, chapter J in, in connection land. Uh, so if I go to 146, this is my uh, uh, capacity. So just so you're aware about the anatomy of chapter J, J2 is about welds, J3 is about bolts, J4 is about connecting elements. So we're looking at the tension member as if it's an element being connected. So that's why we're in section J4. And if you look at the capacity, it says, okay, the available strength for the limit state of block shear rupture is this. 
And you look at this equation and you go, what? Because it just looks weird, you know? Because it's saying Rn equals a pile of junk less than or equal to another pile of junk. You know, wait a minute. Because up until now, we've been seeing like Pn equals Fy Ag. And how do we go from this to this? You know, it's like, wait a minute. That is, that is, that's nuts, okay? But, um, so I want to digest this a little bit. The first thing I'll talk about is the format, okay? So in the specification, the way that the, the way that equations are formatted like this, whenever you see an expression that says Rn equals an expression less than or equal to another expression, it's just the specification say, a way of saying it's the minimum of those two. So what it's saying is, it's basically saying that this is the capacity provided that it's less than or equal to this. So logically follow that through, and it's basically just saying the minimum of those two. Okay? That, so whenever you see an equation like that, that's what that means. Okay? Now, what we can do is we can take this equation and we can really digest it uh, quite a bit okay? and, and, and simplify it to make it a little easier to understand. Okay? So what I'm going to do is, is, is as follows. Let me, let me go back a slide. Okay? So let me go back a slide. Let, let's digest this a little bit. So here what I've got. Let's see what I've got. I've got R min e, Rn equals the minimum of these two. So let's look at these two. Okay, so the first row says a pile of junk plus UBS, FU, A, and T. And then the second row says a pile of junk plus UBS, FU, A, and T. So mathematically, I can pull that out and just say it's the minimum of these two. But for both of these two, I have a 0.6. So I can factor that out as well. So I can take this and make it a lot easier to digest from here to this. Okay, so all I'm doing from here to here is just taking this and rewriting it uh, a given way. And, and if we look at it, this is actually a lot easier for our calculator's perspective because if we look at the first format, I have to calculate each expression individually in order to, to verify which one's the minimum. But here, I can just calculate this, calculate that and calculate that. It, it's, it reduces the number of button pushes on the calculator. So, so this is a faster way of doing the math. Okay, so what do I got? Um, I've got this big hullabaloo expression. Let, let's sort of digest it a little bit. So what is in that big yellow box? And, and well, let, let, let's see. Well, I've got some FY and FU terms. I know how to find those. Those are pretty easy, right? Now, look at the areas. Okay, so I've got AGV, ANV, ANT. What's the deal with that? Well. I know that AG is gross area and AN is net area. So what is AGV and ANV? It is the gross area in shear. It is the net area in shear. What is AGT and ANT? It is the gross area in tension, the net area in tension. So while the equation looks like kind of messy, it's really just the, 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 the same stuff we've been computing this whole time, okay? The only one that maybe is a little new is this term UBS. But in just about every single case, one that we usually deal with in the real world, UBS is one. And for all of our um, cases in this class, we'll, take U we'll, we'll have situations where UBS equals to one, uh, is equal to one. Now, if you look at the equation up here, we have an AGV, an ANV, we have an ANT, but not an AGT. Now, the, the reason I format that, uh, the reason I indicate it, is that in order to compute a net area, you need a gross area first. So we're going to have to end up computing uh, all four. Okay. Now, the only other thing missing is our fee value, and our fee value is 0.75. Okay. And I'll say with block shear, just a note about block shear, fee is actually really easy to forget. Okay. When you're doing a block shear problem, it's really easy to forget applying uh, a fee. So don't forget to do that. Okay. I have I have graded a number of exams in my day where I look at the exam and I see the student did everything right and in the very last problem they forgot B. So don't, don't forget B. Sound good? Okay. Now, um, actually, wait, let me go back. I want, I want to, let me go back. I, I want to make a statement about that. Okay. Now going back to this expression, okay, there's something else about the way this is formatted I really like. 
Um, if, I, if, if, you, if you remember, I said that block shear is a combination of a failure in tension and a failure in shear. And the way that this is, um, this is formatted, I basically have all of my tension stuff right here and all of my shear stuff right here, okay? But notice what's common with all the shear stuff. What's common with all the shear terms is this 0 0.6, okay? So why is there a 0 0.6 attached to shear, okay? Well, in order to explain that, I want to talk about failure criteria, okay? Now, just so you're aware, I mean, I could have a whole graduate course just on failure criteria. I took a graduate class on failure criteria. So I could go on and on about this. But let me sort of, like, break down what a failure criteria is in very simple terms, okay? So let's say I have a piece of steel, and I take a piece of steel and I yank on it, okay? I can mathematically define that that element fails when its stress reaches Fy. Is, is that a fair statement? That if I, so what we say is that it is behaving linearly, it is behaving like a rubber band, it is behaving like elastically until the stress reaches Fy. And once it reaches Fy, this theoretically reaches failure. That is a very simple failure criterion. Does that make sense? Okay. What gets complicated is not when it's yanked on, but when it's yanked on and twisted and bent and sheared all at once. When you have multiple stresses acting all at once, when do you determine that it has failed, okay? And that is where a failure criterion comes into play. A failure criterion is, to put it simply, a mathematical equation that, based on a given state of stress, you plug it in, and you basically can quickly ascertain whether or not it has failed or not. Now, whether or not you have had soil mechanics or you are in soil mechanics, you will see a failure criterion there at some point, and it looks like this. How many who are in soil, how, how many of you who've had soils remember this? If you are in soils, you will see it. Okay, this is the more Coulomb failure criteria. So basically, if you are looking at a state of stress under the ground for a soil, you look at its normal stress and its shear stress, and you compare that to properties of the soil, such as its cohesion, such as, it, as its angle of internal friction. And you are basically able to ascertain whether or not the element or the stress is, is indicative of failure or not. Okay. Now, the more Coulomb failure criterion is a great mathematical expression to define failure of soils, okay? but it is not good for steel. More Coulomb failure criteria are more appropriate for brittle type materials like soils and concrete and things like that. For ductile materials like metals, like steel, it is not a really good one. Okay? The more common one to use for metals is the von Mises yield criterion, okay? So what's the von Mises yield criterion? And, and before I go to the next slide, I'll say, I am not gonna make you all derive this. I'm not, okay? Just relax, this is not gonna be a derivation problem on an exam. I'm not gonna make you break out, you know, the more cool are the von Mises yield criterion. I just want you to follow along the concept, okay? So the von Mises yield criterion looks like this. So basically what you would do is take a general state of stress so in two dimensions, you could have a stress state this way, you could have a stress state this way, and you could have a shear stress, okay? So you take those three stresses and you basically compare the yield stress to this quantity here. And that'll tell you whether or not the element has failed or not. And, and so let's look at this expression. What happens if you set all the terms equal to zero but sigma x, okay? So what happens? This term goes to zero, that term goes to zero, that term goes to zero, and so you have Fy equals the square root of that or Fy equals that. So basically what that is saying is if all you do is you take an element and you yank on it, it will yield, 
when the stress is Fy. And that's just, well, of course it does, right? The, the, the yield criterion has got to make sense for the most basic of assumptions. But the question is not about normal stresses. The question is about shear stresses. So what happens if you set the everything equal to zero but the shear stress? Well, if you set everything equal to zero but the shear stress, you get that is zero, that is zero, that is zero, and you get Fy is the square root of three tau squared. I'm just gonna dispense with the subscripts. So you get that Fy is tau times the square root of three, okay? So what this is saying is that it will yield when the shear stress is Fy divided by the square root of three. And what is one over the square root of three? Well, one over the square root of three, if you break your Casio FX 115 ES plus or similar scientific calculators out, one over the square root of three is about 0 0.5774. And what the Steele manual says is, eh, that's too complicated. Let's just round it to 0 0.6. Okay. So what's happening for metals is that, here's, here's what this is saying. If you have a metal and you yank on it, it will yield when the normal stress is Fy. But if you have a metal and you shear it, it will fail when the shear stress is about 60% of Fy, okay? So the, the real point I wanna make about this is this is a very common misconception when you first hear about this, is you'll think, well, why is that 0.6 there? And students will think, oh, that's a factor of safety. No, it's not a factor of safety. This is a result of mechanics. If I take a piece of steel down to the lab without factors of safety, like just ignore all that, it will fail at a stress lower than its, nor than its normal stress counterpart if you apply shear, okay? The factor of safety would be put on top of this. So if, you, if I say, why is that 0 0.6 there, and you say factor of safety, that's wrong. That, that's not a factor of safety, okay? Does that make sense? That idea kind of, kind of makes sense? Okay. So what, what I'll say is that throughout this class, when you see something in shear, there is probably a 0.6 baked in there somewhere. When we look at the nominal shear capacity of a beam, it's 0.6 Fy times the area of the web. When we look at a bolt tear out capacity uh, later, you're gonna see a 1.2, and where's the 1.2 come from? It's 0.6 double, you're gonna, you're gonna see that later. So I just wanna throw that, um, throw that out there. The bridge spec, by the way, does not use 0.6, it uses 0.58. So if you look at the bridge spec, they go one step further. So if you look at um, shear capacity of plate girders in ASHO LRFD, it says 0.58, so on and so forth. Okay. Now the only thing I haven't talked about is this term UBS. What is UBS? UBS is the, um, so if I go back a couple slides, UBS was attached to the tensile region so if we look here, UBS was, was over here for the region and tension. So UBS is sort of like a, trying to account for mini shear lag, I guess you could say, like a little bit of shear lag around here. But in most cases, UBS is going to be one. The only time that UBS is not one is in cases like this. So what we're seeing here is an eye shape. And what we've done right here this eye shape right here, this is called coping. So this is a coped web, okay? And, and the reason for coping a web is if you're trying to um, erect the building, okay? And you're trying to connect the floor system together. So if we look at the new innovation building, the new business building, okay? If you look at that frame, you're gonna have beams going this way and you're gonna have beams going this way, right? And they have to connect together. But you want to connect them in such a way that the floor is flat, right? I mean, you don't want, like, I mean, how do you connect an I-beam to another I-beam while keeping this a flat surface to be able to place a floor? Well, what you do is you cut a little bit out of the floor beam. So what they do is they cut a little bit out here, and they cut a little bit out here, and they connect it such that it sits flat. That is called coping. That's, that's what that term, have you ever heard, heard of a coped web? That's what a coped web is, is when they cut a little bit out. And for a coped web, the, um, if you ever have multiple rows of bolts, you take UBS to be a half. Other than that, every other case, UBS is one. And we're not gonna deal with any 
uh, of these types of connections in this class this semester. So I, I just wanted to throw that out there that that's the only case where, um, uh, where, where uh, UBS is not one. So does that make sense? All right, any questions? All right, so um, the only other thing I'll mention about block shear, and then we're actually probably running out of time. Yeah, we're getting close. So is that um, when we identify block shear paths, and this will be a, a really sort of a main discussion point for our class tomorrow, is that the possible block shear, uh, the possible block shear failure paths need the following. They need to leave all of the bolts intact. They need to separate the member from the connection and they need to include a path that's subjected to shear. So like for example, if I